when the blurb for the colloquium came round, it said something like there was some degree of consensus on what is required by place-based policies. And that, of course, depends on where you sit. And from where I sit, we don't have that consensus. What we have is the beginning of a debate about what we see in the economy and how we see the economy. And the positions taken in that debate have implications for how we see the political and institutional challenges. So the double aim today is to explain how foundational economic thinking reframes the economy and draw out the implication, which is, I suppose if you want to put it in Foucauldian terms, that we need a new kind of governmentality. What's the foundational economy? How do we do foundational politics? So what's the foundational economy? In the past 30 years, we've become preoccupied with individual consumption, market income, and jobs as the means to, to welfare. So what we want is GDP, GVA. And those are measures of market income. You can dispute the measures. But what we see is that, in fact, and this is um, a diagram, that if you actually look at the share of nominal income growth, the bottom 20% of households get almost nothing at all before redistribution, and the position is similar in other European countries. We are increasing GDP, GVA, but the distribution downwards isn't working. It's also true that the jobs we are creating are low-paid and precarious. And I think everybody in the room should read the James Bloodworth book, Hired, which is about working for Amazon, a care firm in Blackpool, and for Admiral Insurance just down the road in Newport. Uh, demeaning, tedious, ill-paid, insecure work. And I think within this frame of somehow or other the GDP individual consumption thing not working out, we need to think about how our well-being depends on collective consumption, the cost and availability of social housing, the price of winter fuel, the public transport timetable, the access to care or mental health. And what we're doing with the foundational economy is refocusing attention, not on this individual consumption and market income, but on collective consumption. And I think one way of thinking about this is that this is the social infrastructure of everyday life. And I think if we look at this, we are actually concerned here with issues which are matters of collective provision, not individual choice. You can, of course, go out and buy a 4G mobile phone, but you can't buy a network that works. You can go out and buy, um, you know, a cheap mid-market car, which will be automatic and have autonomous emergency braking, but you can't get clean air. Some of this depends on regulation, a lot of it depends on collective social decisions. And let's drill down a bit now to think about why this sphere of collective consumption and collective production matters in the economy. Let's start on the demand side. And on the demand side, these kind of collective services matter because all households depend daily on the uninterrupted supply of universal services. And these come in two categories. They're the providential services like health care, schooling, which we think of as the welfare state, and the material infrastructure of pipes and cables, the Robert Gordon stuff, which connects every house to the systems which don't facilitate economic growth. Clean water, gas central heating makes everyday life possible, safe, and civilized. And as soon as you start thinking about the material and the providential, it gets very interesting in two ways. Firstly, the networks and branches and the provision isn't renewed automatically as income increases. Think of London with its housing problem. 
a housing problem that was solved 50 years ago, but is now acute, even though market incomes are much higher. And also, very interestingly, it's mixed up with citizen rights in some activities. For example, health and education in this country is a citizen right. Um, care is ambiguously a right, and other things move in and out. When I think about collective consumption and citizen rights, one of my favorite quotes comes from the Tory manifesto, the Conservative manifesto of 1951, which declared housing is the first social service. It didn't talk about property-owning democracy. It talked about housing as a social service. Societies move housing in and out of the category of collective consumption. And what we're doing here on the demand side is really setting high-income countries into a senian frame about capabilities that expand opportunity and freedom for individuals to make meaningful life choices. Much of what I have to say is a critique of mainstream economics. All of it basically endorses Sen and Nussbaum. And you can think about the demand side. These services are essential to well-being. On the service supply side, the point is that this is a large part of the economy wherever you go. Because whether it's Nantaglow or Notting Hill, investment bankers and the welfare poor both shower in the morning, shop at the supermarket, and use public transport. And these are very large-scale employers. If we look at the Welsh economy, for example, the providential share of employment, the EDs and the MEDs, account for approaching 35% of the total workforce. That's education, health, and care. And if you look at the material share, the transport systems and the pipes and the cables and all the rest of that, that's about 15% of employment. And this is very interesting because, of course, the characteristics of these sectors are completely different from those of the tradable, competitive stuff that neoliberals like to talk about. These are mainly sheltered sectors with wages and conditions not determined by international competition. It was the university management in University UK which decided to try and leave new entrants to the academic profession with no pension whatsoever. It was not international competition which decreed that result. And it's also very interesting because this is a grounded economy. It has to be locally distributed because that's the only way you reach the population. Um, that doesn't incidentally mean it's got to be locally produced. Clearly, as soon as you start thinking about differentiated, specialized agriculture, whether north and south in Italy or east and west in the UK, clearly the Welsh cannot solve their problems of demand for lamb by eating lamb at every meal. It requires national and international markets and pigs from the east of England, Holland, and Denmark. And if you're starting to think about this kind of economy, I think you've got to make a kind of mental shift. Um, because all this stuff about GVA and jobs is associated with doom and gloom about underperformance. Where I, and, you know, the deficiencies of GVA and then the blessed hope that mobile resources and glamour projects which get onto the, onto the regional news will somehow or other save Welsh bacon. I think if you start to think about this grounded, unglamorous economy of the providential and the material, then you start quite differently by saying, recognize what's there, enable what's there, build on what's there, map resources, build capabilities, mobilize around local issues. Um, something which is really, at first sight, rather more like asset-based economic development than traditional concepts of economic policy. And I remember from Accounting 101 that assets are basically something you useful resources, capabilities that you own or control. So Wales's assets would be our workforce, our SME firms, our third sector organizations, local government and Welsh government. And much of this 
is unglamorous stuff. Sidoli's ice cream in Ebu Vale, Jenkins Bakeries in Llanelli, you know, this marvellous sub Greg's chain with about 30 branches, which when Lee turned up saying, I want to talk to you because you're a wonderful foundational firm, said, fuck off, we've always voted Tory. And <laughs> I think that's absolutely marvellous. Um, you know, and things which are below the radar of traditional policy, grounded firms. And of course, this can't just be localism as with asset-based community development, because as soon as you start thinking about things like public transport, then clearly, the la or care, the lines of funding and control run upwards to regional and national government. And also, you're going to have to start not by saying, as a technocrat, I know that jobs and growth are good for you. You're going to have to start by by asking people what matters to you. I think that's absolutely critical. And that comes to foundational politics. Now, if we look at the old politics in Wales, the UK, or right across Western Europe, the tired old politics is vote for us and we will make the economy work for you. I'm so tired of election campaigns, and one can imagine the next campaign between Corbyn, McDonnell, and the Tories, and both sides will have their version of vote for us and we will make the economy work for you. And there's now a sub-clause about the just about managing the left behind and all the rest of that, because of course they haven't succeeded in making the economy work for you for the last 30 years. And making the economy work is means, of course, more per capita income, growth and jobs. It means attracting mobile investment. It means making the labour market work. And you say, how do we make the labour market? Well, we all know we have a narrow investment in economic infrastructure as transport to work. And we invest in skills as certification for work. We blank out large parts of things. There are many more um, visits made for leisure in Greater Manchester than are made in commuting to work. It's simply a whole economy is being constructed around this kind of framework about market income, jobs, travel to work. And this hasn't worked in the UK because, of course, the UK economy is consumption-led and debt-driven. 65% um, of GDP is consumption, and if you want to buy economic growth, you have basically to boost the housing market, and then equity release does most of the jobs for you. We distribute jobs unequally. Next-generation industries where you can get them employ small numbers of well-qualified young, which does nothing for people who live in Nanticlaw. And we separately tackle social deprivation from economic policy. And, and we continue to believe that a benign and competent government will fix it economically. And then we have the problem that top-down policy with the experts and the government clearly is reaching the point of political failure right across Europe. It's not just in the UK. You look at the outcome of the recent Italian elections. But the Welsh example would obviously be Ebu Vale. What did they have? The Ebu Vale Enterprise Zone, the A456 Duel with nice EU signs on the roundabouts. Colleague Gwent, a shiny FE college, and an ungrateful 62% voted leave. I mean, the whole problem of populism is about the failure to control, of elites to control mass politics in the familiar post-war way. That is going to get worse if you persevere with standard make-the-economy-work policies. And there's an added problem of what we've done in the past 30 years. The foundational economy was part public, part private. And all of it, historically, was low risk, steady return, long time horizon, and expectations of a 5% return on capital. Now, what happened after the 1970s was privatization and outsourcing, bringing in stock market quoted co corporates, private equity houses, and fund investors. 
And the common denominator is all these guys want 10% or more return on capital. And they are applying business models developed in high-risk, high-return, short-time horizon activities, completely inappropriate for the social infrastructure we're concerned with. And of course, you can get to 10% by financial engineering, investment rationing, tax avoidance, asset stripping, and loading enterprises with debt. We've worked on BT or railways, both discreditable stories. And you know the classic example is of water companies in England distributing all their profits to people like Macquarie while loading up with debt and borrowing to invest. Meanwhile, corporate power can be used to boost revenue by confusion pricing, like the multiple tariffs in energy supply, um, all of them designed to make it impossible to work out what best value is in any straightforward market sense. And you can hit on costs by, by, by uh, tackling stakeholders who are a major part of cost, like labour in adult care or suppliers in supermarkets, where you simply pass the costs and consequences on to society. Um, we've not only been over-preoccupied with, uh, with individual consumption and market income, we've also, through privatisation and outsourcing, wasted large chunks of our collective heritage. And I think it's worth thinking about, therefore, the economy in a frame, I mean, I don't know whether anybody here knows their, their early modern history, but it's a Brodellian way of thinking about the economy as a kind of layer cake, as a series of levels. You know, Brodell was high finance, the market, and the subsistence peasant economy. Here we've got the tradable competitive economy, the foundational economy of of essentials, the overlooked economy, which is takeaway food, sofas, and central heating, and then the core economy of the emotional and the effective. And the story today is that in the foundational economy, we've had the practices and the business models of the tradable competitive economy invading the foundational economy. And that we need to think separately about all these parts of the economy. Take, for example, a crucial part of foundational, which is care. It's fairly clear from the demography that we cannot solve the problem of care by paying one fraction of the workforce to actually care for a growing number of old people. Somehow or other, the way in which care has been marketized outside the core economy will have to be rethought. And so it's not simply a question of thinking about the foundational, it's about thinking about all the interconnections between the different things. And I think that would actually give us a very clear objective of government policy, which would not be to buy economic growth, but improve the quantity, quality, and access to foundational goods and services, which requires investment in social infrastructure, breaking down the line between economic and social policy. It requires learning from experiments, because in areas like small business support or reorganizing care, we don't know what to do before we start. It involves adding participative and deliberative democracy, because you're going to have to involve people, not work in a simply technocratic, top-down way. And it will involve coalitions of regional and local actors. And here, in a sense, is the paradigm shift from making the economy work to quantity, quality, and access to foundational goods and ser ser services, from top-down policy to policy as learning from experiments, from benign and competent government which is going to fix it, to a coalition of regional actors. This is a very large ask indeed, particularly in deindustrialized areas like South Wales. Well, I'm always conscious of the destruction of social capital and the networks that made things work, the unions and the chapels. 
on the question of what social actors and educators can replace unions and churches. The Welsh Government is not particularly good at thinking about how to encourage in intermediary institutions. It makes them dependent and it has a slightly romantic relation to cooperation. And apart from the loss of social capital and in institutions, it's difficult because there's a whole series of hard choices which exist in the new order. You would like to have improved access to care, high quality care, participation by the carers and the cares, and you'd like to end extractive business models and exploitation of the workforce. And please explain how you can have all of those at the same time with anything like the current envelope of resources. You know, the Valleys Task Force has been talking about more jobs in care, which seems to me completely, and I agree with, it, with Victoria, whose head I see moving in sympathy, um, completely nonsensical. Um, we are not going to escape hard choices. And in the first instance, what we need are lead institutions and organisations who have the adaptability and the capability to start change. And that means local government, quangos, civic membership organisation, businesses of all kinds. And I have to say, from my personal experience of working with local authorities, I'm not quite an embittered individual after working with Enfield Borough Council and Sheffield City Council, but I think the local councils have serious issues about multiple agendas, fiefdoms, and revolving personnel, which make it extraordinarily difficult for them, with or without city region mayors, to actually achieve very much positively. And really the big question is, we've got some anchor institutions in the public sector, um, and can they become intermediary institutions? Can housing institution associations, for example, move outside housing so they're capable of initiative and catalyzing change in areas like adult care after an inventory of provision? Because we can't trust the local councils completely to reform adult care. Now, for many of you, this will have been a quite different view of the economy for people who've lived in the world of GVA, jobs, economic definitions of infrastructure, rather than the much broader social definition of infrastructure that I'm proposing. So I wanted finally to end by saying that I see this as a renewal rediscovery project in the tradition of liberal collectivism and social democracy. And this, in a sense, takes me back to the work that I was doing in the 1980s in Aberystwyth when I published mainly on Beveridge and Keynes. When we look at the liberal collectivists, the people who wanted the state and the market, which is the position of people like Beveridge and Keynes, um, the whole Edwardian generation, i.e. them, plus the socialists like Tawney, understood the importance of collective consumption. Everybody knew in 1930s Britain that late 19th century clean water and sewerage had added 25 years to life expectancy in our large cities. Everybody knew tacitly that the major socio-technic innovation of the first half of the 20th century was social insurance. And this is quite explicit. You can actually read all the classic texts and they talk about what I've been talking about this morning and what's been forgotten. Here's Tawney in 1931 talking and about piped water and sanitation as collective provision for needs which no ordinary individual, even if he works overtime all his life, can provide himself. We've worked ourselves into a mentality where we think that if people work overtime or we find high-value-added knowledge-intensive business services, it's going to solve our problems. People like Tony understood that wasn't so. Or here's Galbraith in the affluent society, which is basically a problem of social balance, rising incomes, decaying public transport and air pollution, rather like it must be said Greater Manchester in 2018. Private affluence and public squalor. 
This, what I'm talking about today is simply restoring collective consumption to its proper place in our discourse. And, of course, the other thing that needs to be said is that the liberal collectivists who, you know, if I go on mastermind, that will be uh, the topic on which I wish to answer questions, that the liberal collectivists actually um, were concerned with drawing the line between the state and the market, that the state was appropriate for some things and the market was appropriate for others. But they had a much more sophisticated view of the world, which gave a very large role to intermediary institutions. Um, I, things which were <laughs> related to state activity, but not state controlled. If you look at Beveridge, for example, the key text is the 1948 book, Voluntary Action, where, of course, friendly societies are going to provide benefits above the Beveridgean state minimum. If you look at Keynes, then you can see um, there's this preoccupation with expert quangos allocating government funds on the model of the UGC or the Arts Council. Now, what happened in the post-war settlement, and this is one of the major ways in which the post-war settlement went long, is that none of this liberal collectivism <coughs> stuff about intermediary institutions worked out. Firm-based occupational pensions <coughs> trounced friendly societies. Only the Arts Council survived Treasury control freakery because the Treasury did not want to directly give awards to ballet companies in the north of England. Uh, all the rest was actually swept away bit by bit. And one of the really big questions as we revive the thinking about collective consumptions is can we make intermediary institutions work the second time around. Thank you very much.